Okay, now. <laughs> Do you agree for the recording? If I have to, yeah. Okay, so who, who can uh, order this recording? Vertex? Yes, it's on the record book, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Maciej Kolanowski is PhD student. Uh, I don't know what is the stage of your PhD thesis. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Okay, okay so. No, to będziemy ruszać kamerą. Okay, so you are welcome. Panie Maciej, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, how much time do uh, do I have? One hour. One hour. Okay, Go. great. Uh, thank you. So yes, yesterday was Thanksgiving, so I think I should start with well, you know, giving thanks for organizers uh, uh, for inviting me to speak here. And there is some. I I, I think someone is not muted. Yeah. Okay, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, hopefully this. Uh, anyway, uh, this talk is supposed to be an introduction. So uh, I'd like to ask all of you to feel encouraged to interrupt me and ask questions if anything is not clear. Uh, this is not supposed to be specialized talk or anything like that. So I hope everyone will understand uh, everything. So we start with a space time. So we have some manifold, we have a magic tensor, and I will also write down connection because later on uh, I will be interested actually in connections. And this G has signature minus and then pluses. We are in D dimensions. I don't want to restrict dimensionality at least for now. And the main topic uh, is supposed to be horizon uh, or actually many different horizons. But before we can go to horizons, we need to say a little bit about more general stuff, namely null hypersurfaces. So let me define null hypersurface. Oh, let it be hyper. <clears throat> is a submanifold together with some tensor. So N is a submanifold of M of co-dimension one. So this is hyper. And moreover, this Q is a pullback of G. And I will write this pullback by an arrow. It's a pullback of G into this hypersurface N and it has a signature zero plus plus so here we have d minus two pluses so it means this is like a metric but it is a degenerate it has one day uh, it has one dimension of degenerate directions so such that q we have such else that q contracted uh, with this l is zero and for future use, I will describe a space of such else as L. So this is one dimensional, line. so this is line bundle over this uh, N-manifold, and it will be uh, useful, useful later on. So if someone has um, only worked with Riemannian geometries, uh, this may be uh, look really strange that we have some degenerate objects and so on, but this is just a natural wave, uh, way of things in uh, Lorentzian signature. Uh, and to prove it, I will give some, uh, some example. So, as a, so let us start with Minkowski space time. Oh, standard metric, we have, oh, we have levi civita connection on it. And uh, uh, as my as hypersurface, I will take uh, 
sagitted, uh, I don't know. Oh, I want it to be plus. So T is equal to R and let this uh, be larger than zero. So this is a cone without this point. So this is a true manifold. And then eta can be written down as dr minus dt, dr plus dt plus r squared d theta squared plus sine squared theta b phi squared. So my Q tensor, which is just a pullback of eta, is going to be r squared d theta squared plus sine squared theta d phi squared. So we can see that it's this is a two dim roughly two dimensional metric on three dimensional space. So it is degenerate everything worse. Let us notice so, uh, what, what could be an example of a null vector like this. It could be, uh, it could be, for example, dt plus dr. And let us notice that uh, it satisfies. Oh, let me write it like this, so there will be less confusion. That if I will take covariant derivative of this vector field in its own direction, it is zero. So this is a geodesic vector field. So this uh, so this surface is foliated by ge by null geodesics, right? Those those vectors are null, and it's not a coincidence. So basically, observation number one is such that. If we take now general n and l from this, so if we take any section, um, any section of our l, then it satisfies uh, that its covariant derivative is proportional to it. Uh, is there any problem? No. Okay. So basically, uh, we. See that it is unparametrized geodesic and if we introduce a fine parametrization we can put it to zero so far so good uh this is way to prove it is to check it in some coordinate system uh, of course, you need to understand uh, the left hand side in such a way that we extend this L vector field into a space time and then this does not depend upon an extension okay uh so hopefully that, that part was clear. Uh, no, this one, but here. Uh, so now, what is the, if we have a metric tensor, what is the next natural object that we would like to have on the manifold? Connection, obviously. Mm, so let me change the color for this. So we would like to have a connection and obviously we are civilized people so we would like our connection to be a connection on n so we would like it to be symmetric and also uh, to be uh, compatible with our structure so we would like to have uh, yes there should be symmetrization of course thanks uh, so we want our anti-symmetrization, so we want our connection to be symmetric and we want it to be compatible with this degenerate metric tensor. Uh, there is a natural way of thinking how one should do this, right? So I would take some vector fields X and Y, which are well, vector fields on M, and I would just define that covariant derivative of y in x direction is covariant is a space-time covariant derivation uh, derivative, and I need to introduce some extension of those vector fields to the space-time for the right-hand side to make sense, right? Because this is four-dimensional connection. Uh, the problem is that this object, no matter what kind of extension you will get, uh, you will choose is no longer a vector field, it generically is no longer going to be a vector field on our null manifold. So this is this cannot give me connection, right? Uh, and to see that this is 
truly the case, uh, in this example over there, we can calculate a clear idea on the theta is tangent to the surface, right? So let me take uh, the upon the theta and calculate covariant derivative in its own direction. And it's going to be RDR, which is no longer tangent to this guy. So it's not a vector field on this. So that's, that's kind of sad. Uh, this way of work, uh, this doesn't wor work. And the reason is that generically on my hypersurface, we don't have any connection at all, which is of course, which satisfies those two uh, restrictions on uh, why is it so? Uh, the proof is very simple. Usually we introduce connection by its Christopherson. So let us assume that we have a connection and then a standard calculation gives us that its Christopher symbols must be must satisfy uh, can be obtained by metric right so, namely it's going to be q a b comma a b c is going to be one half uh, i'm sorry there should be probably c d here and then it's q c b uh, d plus q uh, c minus q c d b uh, yeah and now i can take a null vector uh, i can take a null vector uh, introduce a coordinate system in which null vector reads simply as d upon dv and contracting both sides with this uh, so it will be LB will give me on one hand side zero because this is uh, this is degenerate with respect to Q and on the other hand I will get minus one half uh, LB Q C B so it's minus one half lead derivative of the metric. So we see that generically uh, we cannot have connection compatible with Q and necessary condition. And in fact, it is uh, also sufficient condition for the existence of such connection is that every null uh, that every null vector is also a killing vector of the structure. Otherwise, we don't have uh, any connections. Uh, is anything uh, unclear? Any problems? No. Uh, okay, if, if anything, feel free to ask. Mm. And, uh, but the point is that even this, uh, this equation does not constrain this thing entirely, right? Because when I calculate D of metric, uh, I will, so I can introduce now some coordinate system such that this is, uh, that I have this V and I have some XA such that L acting on XA is simply zero. So basically from this, uh, from this equation, I only obtain this part of Christopher symbols. Those are given, uh, I can solve it, uh, but there's one missing part. And this missing part is this one. Of course, it's not a geometric object, right? But, uh, never, uh, it's something. And I can encode it in the following tensor, namely, I will introduce tensor SAB, which is equal to minus covariant derivative of this V function. This V function obviously is not uniquely defined, so uh, I can change V and then this S will change as well, but we will go to this later on. And this is exactly equal to this Christopherson. So later on, I will be interested in constraining somehow, in the last part of my talk, I will be interested in constraining somehow this tensor S. 
Okay, so that's all I have about, uh, no, it's almost all I have. One more thing is uh, some natural, uh, is introduction of some natural coordinate systems, which are well adapted to this problem. So let me start with a coordinate system on N and to, to have a global, uh, to have it uh, in a proper way, I will assume from now on that topologically this N uh, is a product of something. I'm sorry. So yeah, it means that there is no para not, not parameter here. And from now, I don't assume anything about this edge. It could be compact, it could be non-compact, uh, but I, I only assume that uh, for L from my uh, line bundle is transverse, transversal to this. So I have some highly non-unique foliation, whatever, and I want this foliation uh, in such a way that this L is transversal to its leaves. Um, okay, so what, uh, so what I will do on my manifold, which I now write, uh, 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 I, I, cho I choose some section of it, say S, such that I have an L vector which is transversal to it. So it could be go like this or like this, doesn't really matter. The point is it's not that I choose a vector field, uh, that I choose a section now. So this is a section of my line bundle uh, in such a way that this is transversal, unless I have some coordinate system. I don't really care what it is, what is it, but I have some coordinate system. Uh, and then I, uh, I take integral lines of my vector uh, vector field L from here. And I have some parameter V associated with this, such that L acting on V uh, is one and V on my S is zero. So there is only one such V. And in this way, I can introduce coordinate system, namely for any point, say here, I will look Okay, this is some v. Uh, I will look at the value of this function v uh, along integral line, and I will look at the point where it started. So this is just xa. Uh, and in this way, automatically, we have that L is simply d upon dv in this coordinate system. Uh, so this is a coordinate system on uh, on uh, N and this uh, degenerate metric tensor simply reads that this is some QAB DXA DXB. There is no V component because this is a de degenerate direction. And now I would like to extend it somehow to my space time. And I will do it in such a way that let me now write this N like this. It doesn't really matter. And uh, that on my S, I also introduce another null vector, d upon the r. Uh, no, let me call it n for now. I introduce another null vector uh, such that what uh, this is. It's, this is just normalization condition, and moreover, I assume that n is orthogonal to s. Uh, there is a unique vector like this. And from for, and now from my head and now I can propagate it along uh, along my hypersurface using my L field. So I assume that the derivative of n on the horizon is simply zero. So then I have this vector field everywhere. And from each point of my hypersurface. Now I, uh, I take a null geodesic coming, uh, which is tangent to this N. So I have now a family of null geodesics. So this is like a family of umbrellas, if you want. And I use this geodesic vector field N to propagate all those coordinates from the horizon to the space time. So now, and I will assume that in this way, I can extend my vector field n. 
So basically, I have that ln of v is equal ln of xa is simply zero. So now I have a good coordinate system, and I also can extend all my vector fields so that I will simply say, oh, so this L is D upon DV, this N is going to, some, is going to be some D, D upon DR, and I have some additional D upon DA. And now in this coordinate system, my metric tensor, uh, my full metric tensor in space time uh, is going to read, yeah. Yeah, I said that. Yeah, it's not, but it is uh, true. Okay. Uh, and now, uh, in this coordinate system, our metric, uh, our metric reads uh, that this is going to be some f. DV uh, and I will proclaim that this R is again a fine parameter along those uh, the, along those lines, and I will take that our surfaces are equal to zero. Okay, now it's unique. So our vectors uh, field will look like this plus two d v d r plus two r h a d x a d v plus Q A B D X A D X B. As you may see, uh, there is no, there are no such terms as GRR because it's supposed to be a zero vector. It's there is no uh, GRA. Uh, it comes also again from the fact that this is uh, a geodesic vector field and this GVR is fixed to be two. So this is, uh, in literature, it's either Niemann Unti or Gauss coordinates. System, um, why do I have R here and R here? That's because this D upon DV is supposed to be the generic direction here. So it has to be, pro uh, so uh, its norm must vanish. And since everything is smooth, I can put uh, just R in front of everything. And also it's supposed to be- Excuse me, I have a yeah. question. Sure. You say that Newman and T, but uh, Bondi was not the first? Uh, no, the Bondi, uh, the Bondi type would be if you had here actually some function, which is, uh, which is two, yeah. two only on the horizon, and, but here you have some addition, some determinant condition. So you can call it uh, both Bondi, Zacks, and Newman Unti actually did it on Scry and not on arbitrary null surface. So I don't really think that matter, and I don't think that they would be offended by this. But uh, so basically, I have this R here and here because I know that G, uh, because I know that uh, G V. V and GVA are supposed to be zero on the horizon. Okay, that's nice. Uh, okay, so now that's truly everything I have uh, about uh, null surfaces. So do you have any questions regarding generic null surfaces? Or can we move on? Okay, I cannot see any questions, so. Let us move on to the killing horizons. So I assume that my, for now, I assume that my space time is equipped additionally with, with some uh, killing vector. And we say that, uh, uh, that n is a killing horizon if killing uh, horizon uh, so n which is a null hyper so it's supposed to be null hyper surface uh, and moreover it's uh, tangent space is given as k 
kernel of this is just a fancy way of saying that this is a null hypersurface k and k is is this null normal to it which was called l before so this is just a fancy way of saying this this k is l uh, and now if we take k equal d upon dv on the horizon uh, and we apply this construction we will get that k is equal to d upon dv everywhere basically it follows uh, from the fact that this uh, this is a unique a unique geometric construction and this is a killing vector mm. and now given a killing vector uh, from the point of view of an null surface it's not exactly unique uh, why why is it so because there is no reason to say oh this k is true killing vector but uh, uh, but two times k is no longer physical killing vector horizon cannot uh, cannot notice the difference uh, on the other hand if you have some asymptotic conditions so if for example this is a clean horizon in uh, of Schwarzschild metric then we also can put some uh, some conditions on this k at infinity and then it will be uniquely defined but uh, from the point of view of horizons we can we have some freedom in rescaling it so basically we can uh, always stick k goes to a k okay and now let me introduce one important concept for given a killing vector field uh, on the on the horizon we have uh, we know that this is supposed to be geodesic perhaps unparameterized and in fact this is equal to what is called kappa or surface gravity of this vector field times k and now uh, and now because we have the scaling one can check that this simply means that this scales as well so it's uh, so the exact value of kappa from uh, is not necessarily meaningful unless you have some additional information uh, okay and now very important fact is Zero, zero flow of law of thermodynamics. So this kappa is some function on n. But now theorem and obviously when I say thermodynamics, I mean thermodynamics of black holes because that's the only interesting interesting thermodynamics there is, is such that kappa is a constant. If either uh, if either n is bifurcated it means that this is in fact true uh, the, 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 this now horizon is uh, uh, in fact consists of two uh, two hypersurfaces which are intersecting each other and at this intersection since k is supposed to be tangent to both of them k is zero uh, and th this case is not going to be interesting for us and the second condition uh, the second option is that minus t a b k b is uh, oh, so I assume that this uh, case, since it's an L vector, I will assume that it is future pointing. Is future pointing? Uh, yes, it should. Thanks. Is future pointing causal? This is some weak version of something which is called dominant energy conditions. And for example, it is satisfied by uh, in Einstein Maxwell theory. So it's it's a reasonable assumption uh, and uh, uh, so it is a constant and now we see the this constant by this rescaling could be put either to plus minus one or to zero and if k is different than zero 
we have non-extreme alkanes. And in fact, one can show that if there is a bifurcation, uh, this is always non extremal case. And the second option is that K is equal to zero and it is totally different thing, it's extremal. Uh, and so as you may guess from the, to from the title of my talk, I'm going to be interested in this one. Uh, let me just, why is it called the zero flow of thermodynamics? That's because, uh, Hawking temperature is given by uh, of this uh, radiation emitted by this uh, by a black hole. If this would be a horizon of a black hole, is given by surface gravity divided by two pi. So that basically means that thermodynamic that uh, temperature of the black hole is the same at each point of the horizon, which makes sense because otherwise it wouldn't be a temperature. Okay. Um, so if I have a extremal, you can calculate, the, you can check that basically this kappa is going to be given by F evaluated at the horizon. It's supposed to be zero. So I will, I can take another power of R from F. So I'll put R squared here and I will change small F to capital F because, because of reasons. So this is now coordinate system for extremal black holes. And this is what we are going to work from now on. Uh, oh, I, okay. I want the I want this coordinate system to be visible, so I will left it there. And now it's time for a very nice trick, uh, which works only for extreme horizons. Let me define the following one parameter family of diffeomorphisms. Uh, I will write it down in coordinate system uh, in this coordinate system that acting on a point v r x a, it goes to epsilon to minus one V, epsilon R, and it doesn't change this part. And of, obviously it is a one parameter, the family of diffeomorphism for epsilon larger than zero. What I can now do is I can take this metric written in this form, and I can apply to this diffeomorphism. I can take a pullback, and then I can, if I want, I can take the limit with epsilon going to zero. So it's no longer going to be diffeomorphisms. So I won't get, well, probably I won't get anything because I'm applying some very singular transformation, but amazingly enough for extremal horizons, I get something. And namely what I will get is R squared F zero. And by this index zero, I mean that every object with this index is evaluated at the horizon. So there is no R dependence in it anymore. R squared dv squared. And there was no V dependence from the beginning because V upon DV was a clean. So, yeah. So now it's going to be, so F is a function of R and XA in here. Uh, it's not a function of V because D upon DV is a clean vector. But now after this limit, all its R dependence will drop out because I will have epsilon times R, so it will go to zero. So now it will be only F evaluated at the horizon. So now it's a function of XA only. So what was the difference between the little F and the little F? Yeah, so the little F was R uh, is this, uh, is R times large F. And I need this power R squared here to have a well-defined limit because this DV squared produces me epsilon to minus two but this cancels out with epsilon to power two from R squared. So this will have a well, uh, good limit. Otherwise I would get some infinities in this limit here. Okay. Uh, so this is it plus, well, two dV dr plus dr which is zero xi plus qa. Yes, yes, definitely. So, I think that Jarosh or Horowitz or whoever it was to notice it must be very happy. Uh, so, what is going on? Let us assume for a moment that our uh, first metric satisfied vacuum Einstein equations. So, so now, uh, 
no uh, cosmological constant, whatever. So, for example, that it was a care solution, extremal care. There, there is such a solution. And so I, I applied to this diffeomorphism. So I get, well, again, care solution, but written in some, uh, in a different coordinate system. But then I took this limit. So it's no longer, uh, uh, so it's no longer diffeomorphic to care. So I get some new space, some, some, some new uh, metric. And you, you can see that this is a well different metric. It is not degenerate whatsoever. Uh, but, but it's different from the one that I started with. But if this one uh, was Ricci flat, this one is again going to be Ricci flat. Because uh, for every value of epsilon, Ricci was zero. So when I take the limit, Ricci is again still going to be zero. So if I had a Ricci flat solution to Einstein equations, in this way, I got a new one. And for example, you could apply this to K solution. And uh, I and you get something new. Uh, it's a long solution, so perhaps I won't uh, write it down. Mm. But okay, so, so what could be else? This could satisfy Einstein equations with lambda. But then again, so you have RAB is equal lambda GAB. Then you apply this diffeomorphism. It still holds for every value of epsilon. Uh, this has a limit. So this again has a limit. So basically, uh, it's not non-trivial fact actually, but you can check that this reach, uh, that if this metric has this limit, is written in this form and has this limit, then reach tensor as well is well defined in the limit. So, so basically what I want to say is that this is well defined. So if I started, so if I started with solution to, vac uh, to lambda Einstein equations, I get new solution to lambda Einstein equations. So for example, I could take care, extremal care solution with a care, care ADS solution or DS, whatever works for you, and obtain any one. Uh, moreover, care is singular, right? Everyone knows it's a black hole, there's singularity, it's not nice. I mean, it's nice because it's a real word, but it's not nice from mathematical point of view. And let's be honest, that's the only thing uh, that matters for people here. Um, but this new solution is actually going to be not singular because there's the, almost no dependence on R. Everything here is smooth and nice. Uh, everything is well-defined. So that's nice. Um, Moreover, you could add some tens, uh, you could add some matter here. So we have Tb uh, minus one over d minus two t gab. And then it follows that since this Ricci has a limit, this has a limit obviously, then this, this energy momentum tensor is going to have a well-defined limit as well. That's, that's cool. Uh, of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that matter fits as such have, uh, have a limit, but at least energy momentum has. Uh, you can check, for example, for, Ma for Maxwell, so for example, for Maxwell that F has a limit as well. Basically, it means that F V A on the horizon is supposed to is zero, because if it were in zero, then upon rescaling, uh, upon this rescaling, I would get uh, epsilon to minus one, and it would cut out. But you can check from the fact that this energy momentum tensor has a well-defined limit. You can check that the, the Maxwell uh, that this is zero, so Ma Maxwell field has has a limit as well. So. That's even better. So I can apply this procedure now, not only to vacuum solutions, but also to Einstein Maxwell solutions and obtain new Einstein Maxwell solutions. And in this way, some new solutions were, uh, were obtained. And now uh, you could ask about, for example, you could start with a form of metric like this and you could ask for Einstein equations. 
and those are those are the necess necessary necessary uh, conditions for the geometry of the horizon here and those are famous uh, new horizon uh, new horizon geometric equations which can be written as I will write them down in full generality together with, uh, with matter fields. At least assuming that I have them here. Okay, I have them. So near her, oh, this procedure is called near horizon, is called near horizon geometry limit because basically what we are doing with this, we are taking uh, R to zero, so we're going closer and closer to the horizon, but when you are going closer to this hypersurface, it looks like this hypersurface is getting bigger, right, because we are closer to it, and this is the reason why we are, uh, why this V is multiplied by V to minus one. So basically, a physical intuition behind this is that we are closer and closer to the horizon, and this is why it is called new horizon geometry. And now we have the following system of equations. This, this is now Ricci tensor of uh, metric induced on the horizon on an, or on the cross section of the horizon, if you want. So basically this is just a Ricci tensor of Q, A, B, oh, let's say Q, C, okay? Uh, so this is equal to one half H, A, H, B, and I, I will skip those in this is zero. Everything is now evaluated at this horizon minus da hb plus lambda qab. Uh, okay, so I don't have actually, uh, but it will be exactly this thing. So plus tab minus one over d minus two t qab. Okay. There is no dimensional factor by uh, probably there is so no yeah okay so let me skip this part actually but here it should be d minus two uh d minus three something there is something here uh doesn't uh, it's not important right now but you, you you are perfectly right uh usually people just rescale lambda so that to, to avoid getting this uh, and this function f is uh, determined algebraically. Mm. Okay, let me actually write this as d to show that this is a connection associated with, again with this metric here, with this uh, d minus two dimensional metric uh, plus uh, minus this. Uh, plus again lambda perhaps with some factor that I don't remember. Thanks. Um, okay, and uh, so on one hand you can think about this as uh, Einstein equations for such a metric. Those are exactly Einstein equations for this metric. But you can also think about those as constant equations on the geometry associated with uh, extremal horizons, whether you took this limit or not. Those, those are just constant equations on the extremal horizon. Uh, the problem of solving this, those equations is hard, as some of you may know. Uh, so let me very briefly give you certain results without any proofs. So for example, in 3D, so if we start with three-dimensional space-time, actually all solutions are known, so it's easy. Mm. All solutions uh, for D, you can either uh, even uh, say in Einstein Maxwell theory, uh, because uh, in a moment I will, will be interested in Einstein Maxwell theory. Uh, so in Einstein Maxwell, here uh, for D, you have uh, all solutions are known, I think, in three cases. Uh, the first one, if this is static space time. So it basically, it's static. It means that the scaling vector is supposed to be hypersurface orthogonal. So K dk is zero. And then you can basically show that it is just, uh, 
maximally so that this q is going to be maximally symmetric as a result uh, so there's static then there's axis symmetry and in the case of axis symmetry you can show uh, you can show that the only solutions uh, are uh, Mm, limits of Kerr Newman with possible cosmological constant. So Kerr Newman lambda. And then uh, and then you could also assume that you are that this cross section of the horizon uh, is is compact, but it has uh, that the genus is bigger than zero. So basically, you, are, you have some hopes. Or, or in other words, that all your characteristic is negative. And then I think the result is that then it's again maximally symmetric, right? And, and static, by the way, uh, as well. Yes, it's going to be static and maximally symmetric. It's, yeah. Uh, okay, so there, there are certain. Results, another results are that, for example, uh, are more general. That, for example, if you have a positive cosmological constant, and if you have some reasonable fields, uh, then necessarily uh, cross sections of these horizons are, are going to be topologically spheres. So this is one. Another thing is that you can show in arbitrary dimension that I like this result, so we'll talk about this but if you start uh, okay so let, let us look at the symmetry uh, yeah. i have a question comments what about the results of Yegel's, the crucial ship uh, yeah okay so what they have shown is that if you take uh curse solution but they did it without cosmological constant i think and without matter if you take care solution and you consider linearization of those of this equation you don't get any uh, and and uh, this those linearized solutions don't have any so uh, linearized equations don't have any solutions uh, apart from just linearization of care so basically in the neighborhood of care if you take moduli uh, if you take space of solutions to those equations when where you have care you don't have anything else uh, in the neighborhood okay. yes uh, and that was done without assumption of axis symmetry mm, okay uh, so uh, oh what i wanted to say a, a little bit is key uh, structure of isometries here so we started with one killing vector the upon dv but you can check that every such new horizon geometry has another killing vector, namely VdV minus RdR. It comes actually from the construction because this is exactly generator of this one parameter of those diffeomorphisms uh, that we used. But we took a limit, so as a, uh, and in the limit, limit should be a fixed point. So this is the reason why we have this additional. Uh, killing vector so we always have at least two killing vectors and now theorem is that in any dimension if you take a sum the solution if you start with solution which has uh, isometric group r so this is the this is d upon dv uh, times u one d minus three so you assume that you also also have uh, axial symmetry but now this works in any dimension then you after taking the limit you obtain uh, o to one times u d minus three so this is o, o to d poincare so poincare times so basically, you, you, uh, in the limit, you obtain uh, you gain no one but two killing vectors. Uh, so this is in vacuum, and in Maxwell theory, you obtained SO to one instead. 
some non uh, non connected component drops out. It's not okay. And you have analogous results for static solutions. That if you have static solutions, then they also have additional vector uh, killing vector. Mm. So that could be possibly somehow uh, a suggestion how one could try to work with these things, uh, with those things in higher dimensions. And now the last part I would like to talk about, which is much less known, is connection on extreme horizons. Uh, so we had this tensor field essay bay, if you remember, it was minus this guy. And then you can check that kappa, uh, which is zero because we are in the extrema case, is given by k a k b s a b. Then from the new horizon geometry equations, we obtain both geometry induced and this vector field H, right? So apparently this H, H A is given by K A and here uh, Q A. <coughs> B, uh, where this Q now is a uh, projection from the horizon to the um, is projection from the horizon to the uh, to some chosen to the section of V equal constant. Okay, and the, so this is already solved. If we solve new horizon geometry equations, we, we obtain this H, but we, we are left with SAB which is just the rest of it. So if I project everything onto this, those slices, I got this S with capital ABs. And for now, this, this is totally unconstrained. Mm. Uh, we, this is uh, on external horizons. And now I want to show that if you actually have uh, that if you actually have uh, Einstein equations, then this part is also uh, the, the, the constant equation satisfied by this thing as well. Yes, um, yes, it is true, but now we are interested in general extremal horizons without taking this limit. And uh, this S has some great freedom because it was given by SAB is given by Cover, the second covariant derivative of v, but this v I can change by adding to this some function, which is uh, which does not depend upon v. And then I take projection on v equal constant, so this will change as well under this transformation. So basically, SAB goes to SAB plus this thing, but it also gains minus this. Okay. And uh, this D again is covariant derivative associated with a metric on a cross section. And there should be the ADB. That's D. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was D. <laughs> uh, so, 
so there is some gauge freedom and the basic idea is that now we take Einstein equations and this SIB in our coordinate system uh, was simply uh, up to some constant variables, perhaps something like minus one half, I think this is QAB derivative uh, with R direction. This is evaluated at R equals zero. Mm. Sorry, where were? Uh, The, the, sure. The, uh, the yeah, yes, it's. I think it's. Uh, it's minus this. Uh, yeah, and here minus. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. So this SAB is simply given by this, and you can. Uh, take Einstein equations and you can calculate the, the R derivative and evaluate them uh, at, uh, at horizon or alternatively you could take this epsilon expansion that, that was here before. So we have this RAB uh, or even R A, uh, mu nu with some epsilon is equal to lambda u nu plus t mu nu minus one d minus two t g mu nu and everything is, is with epsilons. And what we can do now is we could calculate the upon the epsilon and take epsilon equal to zero. You can, it can be proven that you obtain the same equations in this way. Uh, uh, but this expansion is, is in epsilon it's perhaps less clear physically, but it's uh, better for bookkeeping to uh, keep track of different powers of R uh, to get, uh, get those constant equations. So I have, I have them written down here. Oh, shit. Uh, uh, but I was uh, too lazy to write them down in the full generality because they're quite long. So I have them written down here only for Einstein Maxwell theory. And I should tell you what different objects are. So this Q, uh, this gamma here, this gamma here is just Q A B R at R equals zero. And we can also write it down. Okay, Maxwell field reads uh, at uh, at the horizon, or actually in at, in the limit, it reads that this is something like this plus. Uh, oh, actually, this is all you need to know for this part uh, because uh, because I took some symmetry assumptions here, and then uh, this is epsilon equal to zero, and then this part epsilon equal to zero. It's some psi one dvdr plus za dxa dr uh, plus uh, r squared wa dvdxa plus one half r b a b say the xp okay so right now i'm only interested in uh evaluating this equation on the background of the spherically symmetric uh horizon uh in einstein in, uh, in uh, einstein maxwell theory What about epsilon? Okay, so the first time epsilon appears on the blackboard, it's on this upper blackboard. Yeah. As index. Yes, by this I mean so any object, I don't know, say B with epsilon, I mean that you take this, you take pullback of this object by epsilon.
uh, okay, so this is just some expansion. As I said, this is the same as expanding in this uh, R. Uh, so th those are constraints for uh, those are constraints for uh, uh, for this connection because this gamma is essentially a missing part of the connection. This is not well defined problem because we have this gauge freedom over there. Oh, and all the other components can be all obtained algebraically. If we have solution to this, all other guys are obtained uh, algebraically. Mm, this is not a well-defined problem because we have this gauge freedom, but you can show that if you fix gauge, then you, uh, in, a, in an appropriate way, then you obtain a system of elliptic equations. Notice that those equations are actually linear in uh, in our new things in this gamma and this z because everything else we already knew. Uh, so they are, this is a complicated quite long system of equations uh, but there is a chance to solve it because uh, because we have this uh, <coughs> linearity. How much time do I have? Okay. Okay, so basically what you can show, capital Z is this thing. Oh. So what happens with W and D part? Uh, they, uh, they, they can be, uh, uh, we have some algebraic prescription to calculate them. So, but uh, I, I don't think it's very instructive to just write a bunch of equations, right? Um, and as I said, this is only evaluated at the background of uh, of Maxwell uh, of uh, of strictly symmetric background. So you only have electric charge. You could also have magnetic charge, but you can get rid of it. So uh, without loss of generality, we only have electric charge. And now uh, we would like to solve it. Mm. Uh, yes, this psi here is noun. It's basically uh, Q. This is electric charge divided by uh, radius of uh, horizon squared. Mm. Yeah, it is correct. And so uh, at first it was solved by uh, Carmen Lee and James Lucietti uh, for axial, uh, but only assuming that solutions are axially symmetric and without cosmological constant, and they got five dimensional parameter, uh, five dimensional space of solutions. But actually, you can solve this without assuming axial symmetry, and uh, it's quite fun actually, uh, because what you get, you get a few things. So if lambda would so general solution. So if lambda is equal to zero, uh, there's a 16 dimensional space of solutions. So there are 16 dimensional space of, uh, of connections that, uh, that you could have, and they are actually realized uh, as solutions to Einstein equations. For example, you can have a solution when you take this electrically charged black hole and you put it in, in magnetic field. This works. Mm, and it has then different connections. If you have, uh, if you have lambda positive, you obtain that gamma AB is just trace. So basically you have two con uh, you have two possible solutions. You either have the C equal to zero and then this is just a connection of new horizon geometry, or you could have it non-zero and then this is just a connection uh, on uh, on Kernuman the sitter. Okay, and then the last part lambda uh, smaller than zero, and this is a fun part. So basically, if force charge squared times lambda is equal to one minus LL plus one minus two over four squared, L is a natural number 
larger than two, mm, yeah, larger than two, uh, then you have four L plus three, uh, 16, I'm sorry, 11 dimensional, here is 11. And here you have four L plus three dimensional space of solutions. Uh, which right now we don't know whether they correspond to anything. And the second possibility is that uh, it's not equal exactly to this. Um, so otherwise, uh, just QAB is equal to C okay. to this. So this is a pure trace. So basically it means that a plus gauge transformations, of course, everything, those results are after, uh, after gauge fixing, for example. Um, so that means that on one hand, uh, on one hand side, you could expect that perhaps there are some new solutions to Einstein and Maxwell equations. If you have charge with, which is fine tuned to the cosmological constant, and on the other hand, uh, you would uh, you can kind of guess that there are probably no such solutions as extremal black hole put in magnetic uh, put for example in magnetic field uh, uh, in magnetic field uh, such that it is in equilibrium. Uh, and actually, right now uh, we are able to show that this is not published and it's a little bit preliminary. So I, we need to make sure that every coefficient is right and so on. But basically, uh, unless charge is fine-tuned uh, to, uh, unless charge is fine-tuned to this cosmological constant, if you have a spherically symmetric horizon, then automatically, uh, and you assume that everything is analytic because we're doing some expansion. Uh, so if everything is analytic and your uh, horizon is spherically symmetric, then automatically uh, the, the whole space-time is spherically symmetric, uh, and it's just carry, uh, and it's just rising or not from the sitter or anti the sitter. Again, unless this charge is fine-tuned to the lambda. Mm, this is kind of surprising, at least for me, because we actually, when lambda is equal to zero, uh, we have plethora of different, okay, not plethora, but we have a few different external horizons, which are spherically, uh, we, uh, uh, which are spherically symmetric. So as I said, you have Reisner Nordstrom, uh, extremal Reisner Nordstrom. You could have this Reisner Nordstrom uh, put in some external field, but you can also have uh, there is a family of solutions where you basically can put uh, extremal extremal black holes in every point of space that you want, and they are in equilibrium. And uh, and apparently there are no such solutions, or at least they're not highly non-generic. There are no such solutions when you turn on your cosmological constant. Um, so I think it's uh, it's kind of surprising because usually when you have cosmological constant, especially negative, you actually get more solutions. You you don't have any uh, any uniqueness theorems for black holes, but apparently in the case of extremal black holes, it is not so, and you can actually prove some. So I guess that would be it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? Uh, people online, for case, somebody? No. Questions? So, if you think a uh, uh, low hypersurface, which is uh, it has a more complicated topology, I mean, it's well, for in these examples, you have uh, so it was n is equal to so what the notation you have. So I assume that N has product topology. Yeah, yeah. So something that has no not product topology. Mm -hmm. yeah. Has anything been yeah, uh, yeah. For example, there are now solutions to Einstein equations with such horizons. Uh, the primary example would be not solution, but I guess Maciek uh, O here is uh, better suited to tell you something about it. 
Um, I think that uh, the, the, there is uh, there is some ta uh, there was some effort done in higher dimension on constraining admissible topologies, uh, at least for extrema black holes. But then it's not. Uh, but then it was uh, no. But then it was uh, those were constraints on the topology of section, not, not the whole horizon. Yeah, but uh, I would say that for the horizon, I know about NAT solutions and you know Kernat and so on. But I don't know if uh, any other interesting examples. Other questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, these equations live on null surface. Yeah? This equation on black uh, This? No, actually, no. It, it lives on the section of it. Yes. So this is section of null the surface. surface. Yes. So this is uh, the equation on d minus two manifold, a Riemannian manifold. Okay. Uh, if you identify some solutions of these equations with uh, rise and notch. Yeah. It means you identify, uh, say, uh, horizons, yeah? mm -hmm. not uh, neighbor of, not neighborhood of horizons. Yes. Just horizons. Yes, horizon together with connection. And in the past, people were only concerned with metric induced on the horizon and not on the connection and uh, so this is a result from a few, two years ago that you actually have also constraints on connection. But in the, this very last part, when I was uh, I was actually saying about uh, the whole space time, assuming an city. So you can calculate all uh, all derivative in R. You can solve them and uh, you obtain just spherical symmetry in generic case. So. Uh... In, uh, but in some cases, I understand that you uh, assume you, you, you solve these equations, you find uh, you have solutions. Uh, uh, can you extend it to, to full? It uh, uh, okay. So uh, no, not the whole space of solutions. So for when lambda is equal, okay. So for lambda larger than zero, it's trivial. Right, because you just have Reisner Nordstrom. Uh, for lambda equal to zero, uh, part of the part of the solutions were uh, were extended, and those they correspond basically to either Melvin or Ernst solutions, but not all of them. There is some part of uh, modern space which is not yet connected with known solutions to Einstein equations. Uh, in this case of lambda smaller than zero, uh, this is totally new, new constraint. I don't know about any solution which exists only with this uh, with such uh, uh, with with such conditions. So I have no idea whether those connections are realized or not in uh, in the full theory. Okay, thank you very much. If there's no other questions, let us thank again. <laughs> Thank you very much.